Welcome to the Dean Blackman Show, live from Long Island. Free-flowing talk with a charismatic, down-to-earth host. Join Dean as he interviews and chats freely with his guests, ranging from superstar athletes to politicians, industry titans, and everyday folk with fascinating life stories. Dean educates, entertains, and most of all, touches people's lives. You're listening to The Dean Blackman Show, live from Long Island. Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Dean Blackman Show. This is your host, Dean. How's everybody today? In the studio, we have uh, senior correspondents uh, Scott Morell, Anthony Lacauzi, going across to the UK, uh, Rhea Bo. Scott, how are you today? Great. I think I'm dressed to uh, warm. It's going to be a high of 82 or 84 degrees. We're amazing. Gonna, yeah, we're going to break a record. But there's no global warming. No, no. But just amazing hot weather that we have over here. Yep. Uh, Anthony, how are you doing today? Absolutely wonderful. Good, uh, could um, do without some of the heat as I like the chilly wind in the air. But uh, I don't know. have to get used to this craziness on Long Island. <laughs> <laughs> Rhea, how are you doing over there? I'm very good, thank you, and it's a rather lovely day here in England. What kind of uh, what kind of temperatures do you have over there in England? Uh, I need to convert to Fahrenheit. It's about seventy six. Wow, we're in the eighties here. Just amazing, yeah, we, amazing we warm weather. Ridiculous for October. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's uh, it's almost like weather this week, ready to take the uh, top off the pool, the cover. You could. So what happens, what happens to me all the time is when it gets to be this weather change, uh, um, I'm sure you guys saw that I was a little cranky over the last couple of days that uh, when we go for, <laughs> Rhea's laughing already and I haven't even said what I'm going to say, but I'm sure you saw that I was uh, cranky over the last uh, four or five days. It happens to me every single year when we get past the summer and we get into the fall weather. That my um, that's menopause. Uh, yeah, <laughs> menopause. <laughs> Rhea, we're only two minutes into the show, and you're or, you're already getting me, huh? But yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Go my on. my immune system, you know, crashes all the time, right. and I just, uh, you know, I just came down with just an awful cold and and a cough. Did and... you did you have the uh, like Trump sniffle? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So, you know, this is the first time I know it's only three months into having a radio show. But, you know, all the time when I went to work uh, over the years, uh, you know, I always went to work with a, with a cough and a cold. But uh, this is something you can't do with a cough. No, <laughs> so it's not it's, the best medium for that. It's the, it's the first time I had to, in the, in the last three months, it's the first time I had to cancel and reschedule a guest for a show that uh, I was going to have on Monday. Wow. So the cough was just, uh, I just uh, wasn't going to be able to deal with it, with that cough. Well, you look great today. Yeah. So, so I'm, I'm doing it all right like today, great, and yeah. it's, it's great to be on again and, and to be with everybody. But when I'm feeling like that, I'm cranky and uh, tough to be with. <laughs> and it's a good day. It happened over I'm the weekend. sorry, Anthony. <laughs> it, happened over the, it happened over the weekend. And this time of year, I love college football. And it gave me a great time to kick back and watch a lot of college football. Uh, unfortunately, my favorite team, uh, University of Michigan, was off. They had a bye week, but uh, just hung out. And uh, Scott, I don't know if you ever ate at a Buffalo Wild Wings before. Sharon and I did that Saturday. I'm not night. sure I have. I've had Buffalo Wings, but not at that restaurant. I know you prefer more on the upscale type of Not necessarily. Of, uh, restaurant. I, I, I go either end, really. Do you like Blue. wings? Yeah, I do. With, yeah. with blue cheese and celery. Love it. Well, we went to Buffalo Wild Wings in Center Reach here, about 15 minutes from us. And my first experience at, with Buffalo Wild Wings, I love wings, was uh, when I used to visit my son, Jared, at uh, University of Michigan. One of their first locations was built on State Street in Ann Arbor. Just an unbelievable location. I mean, you'd see thousands and thousands of kids. Not only do they have wings... But they must have 100 TVs to watch any football game or any sports event that you want to watch. And that's what happened Saturday night. Uh, it was just the way I was feeling. <laughs> it was time to just get the hands dirty and sticky. <laughs> and uh, even Sharon uh, 
was went along with it. Well, so uh, well, if you know if you have them spicy enough, it does open up the sinuses, so you could have got a, a benefit from that. But Buffalo Wild Wings was first founded in 1982 by Jim Dis- Disbrow and Scott Lowry. They were business partners that were living in Columbus, Ohio. They were driven by hunger and were unable to find their favorite Buffalo New York style chicken wings. So it was uh, it was just a, a great experience and made me feel a little bit better. Uh, another place that I like to go and I love wings. Uh, have you ever been? It was first uh, built and founded here on Long Island. Um, Anthony's Coal Fire Pizza. I've seen it many times, and again, I haven't been to that restaurant. The great, the great legendary Dan Marino, quarterback for the Miami Dolphins, was one of the founders oh. of uh, Anthony's Cold Fire Pizza. So on Sunday, feeling miserable still, was another day of football, watching the New York football giants. And what who, a great day that was. What a great win. Wow. Was that unbelievable? God, I mean, I thought the refs were going to uh, give it to uh, the other team. There were so many f- bad calls, in my opinion. Don't you think so? It was unbelievable. Especially that, that uh, pass interference yeah, when uh, yeah. the defensive men had it. Um, just uh, had you, had you like that? Had you like that game-winning touchdown by Odell Beckham? Was that incredible? Yeah, but he has to calm down a little bit. <laughs> I mean, get real. I mean. <laughs> well, I know we've got a lot to talk to, but I talk about today, but I, I still have to continue on to the weekend. So we got through with the Giants game, watching the Giants game. And after the game, Sharon and I decided to take a random drive up to my brother and sister-in-law's new home that's in Oldfield, Long Island. That's about 10 minutes north of our home here in Tautauga. And it's right up there on the water. It's a magnificent home that they just built. And uh, I want to ask all you guys, and even Rhea over there in the UK, have you guys ever in your life sat on a heated toilet? Mm, No. No, never. No. It's just unbelievable. Every bathroom that you walk into uh, has a heated has a heated toilet that works by you, remote control. I mean, these heated, I'm people. sorry, Ria, go ahead. I said you clearly mix with different people. <laughs> <laughs> Every single one of their bathrooms. I thought you would. You've. I thought no. you would have experienced heated uh, toilets, uh, Scott. No, I'm sorry. But every one of these heated toilets. Uh, has remote controls, it spritzes, it sprays. God knows what else it does. Oh my God. <laughs> it's a duvet. Oh, I, mean. I mean, the remote control can scare you. I mean, Sharon now, there are many days during the winter, if you drive by her house, you'll find Sharon Blackman just sitting in her car, keeping warm with the heat on. She's got the massage seats on. She's got the heated seats on. She can now switch venues and locations and go up to my her brother-in-law and, and sister-in-law and go up to their house and she's got the combination of the car and the new heated toilet. So she will actually not. <laughs> okay, so you, are you telling me that she'll actually stay parked in a car because of the amenities of the heated seat and the massage? Yes, yes. Instead of and staying, how long? And instead how long? Of stay, what? How long does she do that? She could stay out there for an hour at a time. <laughs> okay, is that odd? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so so it's uh, it was quite a uh, quite a she could switch off now. It was quite a quite a weekend. So uh, another thing is, did you know that today is National Meatloaf Appreciation Day? Meatloaf, the band or the delicacy? The delicacy. Okay, I never knew that one. Uh, Anthony, do you like meatloaf? No, absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> How about you, Ria? Do you like meatloaf? Yeah, it's okay. Don't mind it at all. Is it a big delicacy out in Europe and the UK, meatloaf? Uh, maybe amongst the Jewish community, but I don't think so as a whole. I think that's more brisket you're thinking about, Ria. But um... <laughs> right, Scott, you're right. Uh, okay, Scott, how about you? Do you like meatloaf? Uh, it's a, it's a, it's okay. It's really a poor man's steak. I always viewed yeah. it as. It just seems like every day there's a National Appreciation Day for something. Yeah, and, uh, Hallmark created I couldn't, that. I couldn't believe when I heard that. My mother made an unbelievable meatloaf. It has, it has to be soft. And Anthony's going to get a kick out of this because he always picks on me that whenever Sharon has her muffins here, I'm always ripping off and cutting off the tops. When it came to meatloaf growing up in our house with five sons, five brothers... Uh, I used to always fight with my brothers. They used to chop my hands off because I always went for the end piece of the meatloaf. And that, it seems like with muffins 
and with meatloafs and cuts. You like ends. Yeah, it's like with prime rib. Right. Prime rib, I have to, I can't have a prime rib unless it's an end cut. No, you need an end cut. One of the most classic stories I ever have on some something like this is a dear friend of mine for about 37 uh, years. Uh, there's the great Hall of Fame baseball player from Ponce, Puerto Rico, uh, legendary Orlando Cepeda. He, uh, Scott, have you heard of Orlando? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, he's the, the baby bull, uh, Cha-Cha. I uh, love music. That's why they called him Cha-Cha. But this is a classic story, and, and I, I know that Anthony will appreciate this the most. But, uh, you know, he we were in a great restaurant here on Long Island, Scott, that you're familiar with, Peter Luger's in Great Neck. Absolutely. Uh, this was years ago. So Orlando flew in, flew into Kennedy Airport. I brought him out to Peter Luger's. That used to be a tradition for us. Mm-hmm. And uh, about an hour later, the great Hall of Famer, Bob Gibson, was waiting for us in the parking lot. And we were late for Bob Gibson. Our meal was running late. And here we're holding up the legendary Bob Gibson. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that uh, you guys, to continue with this story about ends, uh, a great classic Peter Luger's cheesecake was served to us. And what did I do? I started cutting the back end of the cheesecake, you know, where there's that great, delicious, you know, crumbs, the yeah. taste thing. And we got into the biggest fight. Orlando was <laughs> furious. <laughs> <laughs> so there's there's something there's something about ends that uh, that I just love, you know, that I'm attracted to. Yeah, so, but not uh, r- not rare ends. I said. <laughs> okay, just ends in general. Okay. But speaking of my friend, you know, what kind of great baseball player he is, and I got to do a little bit of uh, a, a trivia with his Scott on this. Orlando Cepeda is a trivia question. I might not get it. Back in 1966, one of the worst trades ever in Major League Baseball. Orlando Cepeda was with the San Francisco Giants. Who did the San Francisco Giants trade Orlando Cepeda, Cepeda to in 1966? It, was, it goes down still as one of the worst trades ever in history. Willie Mays? Nope. Damn. Orlando Cepeda was traded for the pitcher Ray Sadecki. Interesting. Ray Sadecki. Okay. And Orlando Cepeda, 1967 against the Red Sox. Right. Uh, not only did he win the National League Most Valuable Player Award... But the uh, the uh, they went on. The St. Louis Cardinals went on to win the World Series uh, against the Boston Red Sox, four th- four to three. Now, I don't, you know, I don't even want to know why I said Willie Mays. That was the '69 Mets. Okay, so okay. going on, I saw some great pictures of you and and your daughter Brooke uh, at the Barclays Center opening night, opening at the night. NHL, uh, the, the Islanders. Islanders. Wow, tell yeah. me, tell me about it. Well, we uh, were fortunate enough to get uh, a suite seat on StubHub maybe a few hours beforehand uh, on the cheap, if you will. And uh, it was a classic game. And the Islanders, of course, always the last minute or two of the game, they always give up the winning goal. And they did that again with one minute left. The other team, the uh, Mighty Ducks, Anaheim Ducks, scored with a minute left. So we went into overtime and then we had our uh, salvation. We, we scored a beautiful goal in overtime. Everyone was going crazy. And it was just all out mayhem when we left the Barclays Center with everyone cheering, let's go Islanders. It was, it was a great night. Wow, what a great night. Rhea, have you ever been to a hockey, ice hockey game? Um, No, I haven't, no. When you come here to visit us in New York, Scott Morell's got to take you to a game. He's an avid hockey fan. Absolutely. <laughs> Scott, you got lumbered with me. I'm sorry? You got lumbered with me, not Dean. That's right. <laughs> and I've got to see I've Rhea. All, you already. I've got to see Rhea all dressed up in an Islander jersey with a nice tall glass of beer in her hand. Can't see that at all. No, no, no. Okay, I, I could, I could see it. You could see it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I have well, more imagination. <laughs> my last, my last topic uh, of interest uh, before we get on more with the show, I think uh, is going to interest more uh, Anthony and Rhea because of their love for music. But uh, I, uh, it was very impressive that uh, this past week, the Swedish Academy awarded the great Bob Dylan the Nobel Prize in Literature. I mean, Dylan was one of the most authentic voices in America that America has produced. I mean, I still love that great song, Like a Rolling Stone. I mean, maybe you, Anthony Aria, could sing for us a, a little bit of <laughs> how does it feel to be on your own right. with no directions home? But uh, what do you think of that, uh, Bob Dylan, Nobel Prize? 
I think it's fascinating. Um, the guy was uh, musically brilliant. A lot of uh, I've heard people try to discount him as a musician because he um, didn't know that many chords, but he was able to uh, construct his music in such a way that uh, it didn't matter if he only knew three or four chords. Uh, the authenticity of his voice and the way he wrote his lyrics, um, I think, made him absolutely brilliant, and especially for the time period in which he came out. Um, kind of turn things upside down on their heads, so to speak. And uh, I always say I grew up in the wrong time period as far as music is concerned. You know, I missed the, should have been born in the 40s and I could have grew up with the music of the 50s, 60s and 70s. That would have been ideal for me, you know. But even though being only 29 years of age, you, you appreciate uh, Dylan. Oh, absolutely. You know, I, I mean, I play guitar. I, I, oh my God. I'd I be see. hard pressed to find one guitar player that doesn't appreciate I mean, Dylan. he didn't have the greatest voice, but his uh, his uh, words were just yeah. uh, I, I, Anthony, It's I all see, about the delivery. I see you loving the 70s music, the hard rock, right? Oh, yeah. 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 Let's, yeah. Uh, let, let, and, let's hear what we... 60s Rhea. Beatles? Let's, yeah. Let's hear what Rhea has to say about uh, Bob Dylan. Rhea. I think he was a fantastic poet. Um, but I've heard through the grapevine, the Nobel, they can't get hold of him to give him the awards, can they? She's wow. right. Yeah, wow. no, I heard that in the news today wow. also. That's wow. correct. I didn't... Yeah, I, heard, I saw a story, well, a headline somewhere saying they've given up trying to get a hold of him to give him the award. So, I don't know, he's on planet nine somewhere i think <laughs> but i think he's a great poet dean in an answer to your question yeah i just you know my time uh, and even when i was younger just uh, legendary so uh, on that note that's uh that's my beginnings of the show and uh why don't we get started uh scott well i was thinking about a lot of things this weekend what to talk about and uh one of the things that really hit me especially geopolitics, the election coming up, um, and Rhea, who's um, uh, in the UK and really has a pulse of the people around the world, um, I wanted to throw this question out. And really, how do you think the world views the United States of America? And uh, Rhea, I'd love to hear your thoughts about that. Um, you know, the pros, the cons, it could be all cons or all pros or a combination of both. Well, this, that's a big question, isn't it? Um, I think it needs breaking down a little bit, actually, maybe into, do you mean the government or the people or the various cultures? Which bit or just all of it, Dean? I, Rhea, I, uh, listen, what's so, what's so, Scott, if you don't mind me uh, interrupting you. Sure, absolutely, um, please. What's so unique here to Scott's topic and subject is that we're extremely fortunate to have, you know, a friend and colleague and someone over there, right there, that homegrown and and right there on the spot for us. That uh, I think it's open. I think you should try to. I think uh, all three. I think. Yeah, try, I, I try think. To, I, yeah, let's break try it down. To, try to break it down. Let's do geo geopolitics first, and then we'll go to the people next. Absolutely. Let's, okay. Okay. So you want a geopolitical outlook? Yes. Um, could I say that the world sees that um, America's going to save the world? Sounds about right. And that's right. a joke, darling. I, <laughs> boy, that is as dry, dry as right. sandpaper. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Good warn it was dry. Um, how, how do we see it? Okay, as a people, I think people see on the positive side of a culture um, a land of opportunity, possibly. Maybe not so right now, but on the whole but also with that lives in a bubble. So it's kind of that bubble thing going on. Uh, I've heard a couple of people on the show say it as well. Um, there was Stu Pollock, you know, there's Long Island, there's New York, and then there's the rest of the world. Um, so there's a bit of a bubble thing, lovely people. My experience of the States, which is only really the West Coast, was a fantastic time. So it's a people thing. As a culture, I think the cultures vary. Um, what is it they say? Leave the East Coast before you get too hard and leave the West Coast before you get too soft. Yes. And as a government, which is the face of America around the world, um, where would you like me to start, Scott? Well, uh, how, how, how do they view our military might in a positive or negative way from humanitarian efforts to um, trying to uh, intercede in, in some geopolitical conflicts, you know, in the Middle East and elsewhere? It's a big question. I feel 
honoured to voice voice the opinion of the world. <laughs> um, but having said that, um, I don't think it's particularly viewed in a positive light. Um, when you look at all that's going around the world, um, you're there in terms of unrest. So it's for everybody to fathom out from the narrative that they live by. So, you know, what someone, say, in Asia hears, is it the same as someone in America hears? Is it the same as someone in the UK hears? If they're taking that, if they have an interest in geopolitics, which I think a lot of people don't, um, that's the narrative they live in. So if they believe that, if they that's the fundamental word, believe what they're hearing, then that is the rule book that they're taking decisions from. So it's all to do with the press on how people view America, Scott. Okay, so if a country had to be aligned with a with an with another superpower, um, and they had a choice, uh, would they rather be aligned with the United States or with Russia? I think it's changing times. It's a pivotal time, really. Um, People know that or people think that the the major shift of power is coming from the US to Asia. And I think um, people are people are picking sides, really, I think. Um, You have President Park in South Korea is just pallid up with the US, which has opened up that region of the world for the US to get stuck in down there under the pretext of helping. Uh, because they have North Korea to the north of them. You have the unrest in the Philippines. President Duterte of the Philippines has rejected the U.S. um, in a big way. I know. I heard about that. I know. And pallied up with China. You have all the unrest in the Middle East. You've you've just recently bombed Yemen from the ships. Yeah. You're kicking off in Iraq. You're kicking off in Afghanistan. You've got the Syria problem. Um, many believe that you try to replace the government in Turkey. Many believe that you have replaced or got your guys in the Ukraine. Uh, you're all around the Russian border. Do you want me to go on and on? Rhea, no, I want, no, no, what no I, that's what a plateful. I, Rhea, what I want to, it's a plateful that Scott said. What I want to ask you is I, I, I assume you're going to say that this is the most uh, unrest we've had uh, in history. It is. I'm watching the world. I watch the headlines, as you know, around the world. So I get to see what the Philippines see on the whole. I get to see what Russia sees on the whole, what the US sees. Um, So I get to see it. And so my narrative that I live my day to day in is is often different from people that I speak to, which can cause a conflict. Um, Because I want to say, no, it's not this. It's that there's another side to that story. But I've kind of learned just to go, you know what, it it is what it is. And I've become more aware of late of there is a global playbook at hand that not many people know about, Dean. Interesting. Uh, Rhea, um, I I wonder if there's a paradox out there. Um, I'm interested in hearing how um, you think um, the rest of the world views President Obama and how that correlates to your narrative right now, how you feel the rest of the world views American uh, might and American military power, Um, because it seems like uh, Obama is very well liked. Uh, I'd like to hear from you over, uh, you know, from from the other side of the pond. And uh, is that a contradiction in any way? I think it is, actually. There is a paradox, Scott, probably the right word, because I think when he first come on the scene, I mean, he's a good speaker, right? Yep. You know, there's no getting away from it. He's a good speaker. So if you took him just as a speaker, you'd go, yeah, good guy, you know, uh, better than the two you're looking at at the moment. <laughs> anyway, so, so there's that. But there's also you've got the evidence because he now has a history in politics, doesn't he? Of course, with anybody's history, is that there's a few skeletons in the cupboard. And the statistics kind of speak for themselves. There's been more journalists. There's been a lot more unrest underneath those slick speeches, Scott. You know, so you know what I think is interesting? Um, Bush and Cheney were neocons, and they you know, went into Iraq on false pretenses, and people really perceived them as you know, very uh, militaristic and trying to create democracies in countries that were under, relatively uh, under control. Uh, Obama came in, and his narrative still, and the way he speaks, um, he, he he's taken 150, 175,000 people, uh, sorry, um, 
uh, military people out of uh, Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, he wants to withdraw as much as possible. So um, has the world changed their vision about American might and influence in the last seven years compared to the Bush administration? Oh, massively, massively. You got to remember in the Bush administration, people people weren't privileged to the information that they are today. It's only in the really, the, say, the last five years-ish, since Obama's term, that people can go on YouTube and hear a different point of view, can go on Vimeo and hear a different point of view, Twitter, the whole thing, the whole place is saturated with different points of view. Well, when Bush was in, you just had mainstream media. I mean, your mainstream media is like the UK's mainstream media. Is completely brought and paid for. It's not a mystery. It's not hidden. Everybody knows it's brought and paid for. So you just got one narrative where now you've got narratives coming from Bangladesh, China, from all over the world in this massive cooking pot, which they're taking care of as we speak by censoring various different situations. For example, in the UK, it's all it is totally dominated by anti-Trump in the mainstream media. And I kid you not, I've not heard the name Clinton mentioned once in the last three weeks. Wow. Um, you you make an excellent point, Ria, and I didn't think about that. Um, even though probably President Obama is viewed in a better light than Bush, uh, not an, as antagonistic, um, he came in in 2008 when, it, you're right, social media exploded. The iPhone came in on just in uh, 2007. So although uh, we might have been viewed apples to apples in a worse light from 2000 to t 2008, um, the fact is that because of the information flow, even though we can be perceived as improving our relations overseas, the net effect because of social media and other ways to gather and, and receive news were, were perceived worse right now. So it's really not the policy, it's really the information. Is that what you're saying? Oh, no, there's policies as well. You've got the revolving door policy <laughs> where someone's in a corporate company, then they're in government, then they're in a company, then they're in government. Um, you had a scientific arm to the government, which you don't have anymore. Um, there are now lobby groups that are also brought and paid for. Um, the world definitely views uh, America as super corrupt and is more visual now as well. And you could conduct military manoeuvres around the world under George W. Bush and you would never know. Wow. You know, you just wouldn't know that you just nailed um, from that wall ship the corner of Yemen. So now you have clear access up the Red Sea to seize the Suez Canal should something go off. And also you've got the clear road in past uh, the island to Israel. So all this strategic play is going on and we're amidst just huge amounts of information and you have to sift through it, go, you're nuts. Well, there might be something in that. Um, the mainstream media, well, God, that they're like the mainstream media in the UK and America, Scott, are like their main lining on cash in straight into the vein, as it were. They can't get off it. So people realize that the media is getting in the way of of actually finding a cure as it were um it, it's a big big problem to read through all of those situations but i have a simplified example of a way to possibly give a solution as opposed to i don't know what to do scott Rhea, i've got uh, i've got a question to ask you uh, before we go over to anthony he's waiting to uh, ask uh, some questions of you um you know, I'll never forget the other day when you asked me, uh, am, I, am I aware of uh, Yemen? I said, I did not know it. And uh, you informed me of it. And I, when I went uh, to our mainstream media, it's amazing how, you know, it was basically just, you know, put very small, pretty much as uh, news goes across the bottom. You know, we're pretty much uh, a lot of people don't read. It was just uh, very small across the TV. Uh, but obviously, I, I would not have known about Yemen unless you told me about it. No, I have a story on Yemen, actually. It was around that time. I was, but I'll tell you, nevertheless, um, Yemen is a disaster. It's a major disaster. And it's another, another, another overthrow of a government that the US are right in there. I was um, on video talk to a journalist driving into Yemen after the hospital was leveled. There was a hospital that all forces had the coordinates of 
And there was a US-Saudi coalition strike, drone strike, levelled the hospital, kill, killed everybody in this hospital and what have you. And the reporters are driving in. I'm on a video call with a reporter in a car driving into Yemen. They find a guy at the side of the road to speak to, like a local Yemeni guy, lovely guy. They wind down the window. They put the, put the microphone out with the name around the mic and everything. I won't tell you the name. And he says, you know, basically what's going on. Guy starts to tell him, oh, my God, you know, um, he's holding the bombs of the U.S. that made in the U.S. and the U.K., going, look, these things are just raining down on us. And then it was just pop. He was just shot in the head midway through the conversation. Wow, Man, wow, wow, wow. Let's go over to Anthony. He's waiting to get into this conversation. Crazy. Um, I mean, there's uh, there's kind of the, um, to me at least, uh, two, two aspects of this conversation. There's the... Uh, like you mentioned before, Ria, the the general population and their and their consensus kind of on uh, our country and on Americans themselves, and then there's the uh, geopolitical realm of um, you know really what's happening. And I feel that the general population doesn't have a consensus on that because nobody really knows. Like you guys touched upon with the mainstream media um, and these topics that should be headlines, being these small little side bits on uh our news websites and our uh television uh news broadcast so i saw an interesting article on the daily mail um where they interviewed different people from all over the world china france thailand berlin uh italy to ask them um what they really think about uh americans and um many of them touched on the typical negative stereotypes that we hear um, and things that we have issues with in this country, uh, obesity being one of them, uh, geographic ignorance being uh, another one of them. Um, others viewed the country as being uh, being being very wealthy, um, while others said that uh, we focus on quantity and not quality. Um, so I think uh, a lot of these things... Um, are true. Being an American, I, I can agree with them. I'm, I'm, I'm sure we all can. Um, the article goes on to talk about um, the tremendous pop culture influence that we have with programs like MTV and uh, Kardashians, uh, and also this concept of the uh, American dream. So I'm just curious to hear from uh, your side of the world there, going across the pond, um, if you can touch upon uh, some of the things I just mentioned from this Daily Mail um, review that i read okay um firstly let's put the daily mail into context the daily mail is nearly a red top newspaper for stars so um i think what you've said has substance but if you just pull away from the earth and just look down at people i think we're all the same if if we have if our well-being is in reasonable shape i think people are just kind of okay um and we're all much the same. It's it's differentiating the face of America to the people of America because it's different. You know, how someone wants to portray America, I don't think is representative of the people at all. Uh, myself, I think I think that's a fundamental difference of the the face that an organization presents and what's actually going on, Anthony. Listen, I want to I want to close out this subject with a few uh, this topic with a few comments. Uh, all I know is uh, maybe it's just living here in the Northeast that uh, there's always that perception we live in such a fast paced world. And Rhea, even with uh, it's experiencing. Uh, since you came on to the show here, uh, our personalities, uh, I mean, there's no question about it. Americans always need to win. We're, you know, at least us guys here in the Northeast, not in the uh, uh, middle, you know, middle part of America or Fly in the Southwest. Country. I mean, it's uh, an extremely fast paced environment, stress, always got to win, uh, sometimes chasing after something. Uh, that uh, we might not want just to be socially accepted even here in America. So, uh, you know, where there's that perception of being that Americans, you know, are loud, selfish, uh, flashy. But, you know, you know, it's no different than six in the morning because we were starting early. 
I started out the Starbucks uh, this morning. Scott, I don't know if you still continue to go to Dunkin' Donuts. I had a Dunkin' Donuts, With yes. Starbucks, but, uh, you know, if you pick uh, a busy, you know, 6 a.m. in the morning, Starbucks, you know, if I'm one of uh, three or four cars pulling up into that uh, parking lot at Starbucks, it's amazing what you witness as I'm getting out of my car. You see the three other people just running, <laughs> running to be, to beat me online. I mean, I can't even for Starbucks. Re, Ria, does that go on in Europe? I mean, uh, it's uh, at six a.m. in the morning today. Well, you just pick up your gate pulling, as you're walking. I'm pulling up the Starbucks. I'm just routinely right. parking my car, and you're looking and at the sun I'm, as I'm getting out of my car. You know, you see the three other people slamming their doors and they can't run quicker <laughs> to beat me online. I mean, does that happen? Does that happen in the UK and Europe? Um, it probably does in the bit in London. Yeah, probably in London. Um, OK, so so all, all I can say is no matter what quirks we have, Americans, all I know is I keep reading that uh, that no matter what Europeans say about us Americans, what I'd like to know is. Why do Europeans in great numbers and records, why are they still traveling to the United States? <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> I wanted to end this. This is, this is a great subject. I wanted to end this on a, on a very light note and see if Rhea gets a little kick out of this and if she agrees. Um, I read something in Market Watch, uh, five reasons the rest of the world thinks Americans are completely bonkers. Um, do you want to guess any of those five reasons and see if you match it, Rhea? Wow, I need to think about that then. Um, I know, I put and, you on the spot. Before we, before we split the subject as well, I had a bit of a solution to understand what was going on geopolitically, why, sure. why we think you're nuts. Um, let me have a think, let me have a think, let me have a Remember, think. this is lighthearted, this part. Um, do you know, I, I don't know anything particularly lighthearted off the top of my head. No, that's, I, I know, I put that on spot, and this could be anything, but tell me if you agree. Um, one of the first things is our tipping policies. Um, I understand that uh, you think that's a little bit odd. That uh, no, it's, Well, I've been to America, so it's the standard thing, isn't it? Yes. Um, everything is drive through drive through everything. Is that, does that ring a bell? It's much the same here. Okay. How about the dizzying array of pharmaceutical ads? Uh, much same here. Big pharma, they've got a grip everywhere. Wow. This might be a little different. Um, the rest of the world views uh, Americans as very friendly towards strangers. Um, we're always smiling towards strangers. Now, I don't perceive that. I don't know where that came from. But in New York, it doesn't apply. It doesn't apply, in right? New York, exactly. does not apply. I think maybe in Arkansas, uh, yeah. Anthony. Yeah. Um, so I, I, you don't even have to comment about that because I don't agree. Um, and the last thing that I think you might get a kick out of... Um, uh, the Europeans are very perturbed about the gaps between the doors in public toilet stalls. Does that uh, make we're any sense? We're still on. We're still on toilets. You will be back. We're, I, I, I had to wrap it up with toilets. You had to heat a toilet. What, what, and this is all part of the, the toilet theme. Uh, that's what we're talking well, about, right? After we get through toilets again, I want to get back to Ria. I want to give okay. her a trivia question. But, but isn't that interesting? They think the gaps are too wide that you could actually see through when someone is on the stall. Right. Uh, <laughs> did that ever come up in conversations in uh, you know fifty miles northwest of London, Ria? Um, well, no, the problem is, is my background, I've traveled a lot, you see. So if someone's been to different cultures, the culture shock of a gap on a toilet door is not the same as going to Calcutta. <laughs> <laughs> very good, very good. That's why they say the sewers of Calcutta, it's terrible. I, All I'm right. Comment on something, though, Scott, quickly, is in you guys are good at small talk. And small talk is a wonderful, wonderful thing that we don't have in England. Hmm, you really? know, I, when I was in L.A. for a while, um, anybody, I could talk to anybody and they could talk to me. And if you was in an elevator, um, you would chat in the elevator. That would never happen in England. Well, well that goes with what I said about uh, we're very friendly to strangers. So that, that makes a lot of sense, actually. That but you're but saying why that. does it not happen there? Is it because people are just inherently shy or they just don't want anything to do with the strangers? Or I, mean, I think it's seen as um, possibly uncouth. Oh, really? Like you guys yeah. are too proper to be speaking to right. strangers? Yeah, kind of thing. Uh, me, that's not me, darling, but I'm just saying as a culture, um, if you was in an elevator, it is 100% silence. Wow. 
Well, wow. it's, a, it's an awkward place to be, regardless. <laughs> before anyway, we, elevators before, are very awkward. Before we, before we get on to uh, our next uh, subject, Rhea, I've got to ask you a trivia question. Uh, what day in America, what day in America is the most amount, volume of food consumed in America? Oh, um, the most volume of food, 4th of July. Nope. I'm not even going to ask the guys here. It's Thanksgiving. Yeah. Rhea, the second one. They don't have can you can right. you guess? Can you guess what the second day in America during the calendar year? What one day is the second most volume of food consumed? Can I just ask you something? Which day is Thanksgiving? <laughs> That's the day where we uh, sit around and we celebrate the uh, pilgrims that give thanks the, for the Native Americans when they shared the turkey together. Yeah. November 26th, is it? Uh, no, it, it, November it, it, it alternates. It's not a fixed it day. Alternates. Oh, it's the it alternates. It's the last Thursday day of November. Of yes, November. that's correct. Yeah. And a lot of people don't consider Thanksgiving such a wonderful Rhea, holiday, which, is, which are the Native Americans. Rhea, if you don't know the answer to the second day of the year that the most amount of food here is consumed by Americans, I'll ask a... Wow, Rhea. Super Bowl, she said. Rhea, very impressed. Did she say the Very Super Bowl? Very impressed. Rhea, did you just look that up while we were delayed here <laughs> in conversation? Th- no. Rhea, I didn't uh, even think on, of that. Rhea. That's really impressive. Scott didn't even know nope. that. Anthony didn't know that. Nope. Very impressive, We were going to go Rhea. with Christmas. Rhea. I think for doing that, I think Scott's going to take you to the Super Bowl this year. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so what... Is right? Yes. What one, <laughs> item, what one item of food is consumed the most? What one item is consumed the most on Super Bowl Sunday? Rhea? Oh, got to be hot dogs, isn't it? Nope. Is it a drink, a beverage, or a food? I'm just saying what, what item. item. Oh, God. What it, item? It, has, it has to be beer. It's beer. It is going back to earlier in the show, chicken wings is the number oh, one wow. food product consumed. Wow. Higher than pizza and yeah. hot dogs. Well, I would last guess year, that if it was last food. Year, last year for uh, Super Bowl Sunday. Super Bowl Sunday. Now, we're not just talking about at the game. We're talking about in every home and across the United States. There was over 1.3 billion chicken wings (laughs) consumed uh, on Super Bowl Sunday. So... Moving on, where it sounds like chicken wings and toilet seats yes. are very, uh, very big discussion in today. Yes. <laughs> about how the world views Americans. I don't know where but I got Rhea, to that. Rhea, great insight on the discussion of how uh, people internationally outside of the U.S. view uh you and Americans. I, and I got to tell you, I learned. Thank, thank you, Rhea. I, yeah, thank you, Rhea. I really learned a lot from you on that, uh, especially the social media aspect. Let's move on to another subject, Scott. Okay. Um, this is for all of us. What do you think America will be like the day after Election Day this year? Wow. With such a divided wow. country wow. and uh, most di- divisive two candidates ever in the history of politics, Anthony. Uh, I like to. Start, a, I, I like. I, I know your views. So I like to hear your thoughts about this because there's going to be a uh, winner and a loser. I think there's going to be riots. Uh, <laughs> Pitchforks. I, see, I seriously think there's going to be riots, though. I'm, I'm not kidding. Um, I really think that there's going. Uh, this it's going to be madness. I I just I just I have a gut feeling that uh, people are going to be very upset uh, on both sides. You know, regardless of who wins, and. Um, I, yeah, I have nothing else to really say other than I think there's going to be legitimate riots in the streets. Uh, I, I think that's a, that's a good possibility. Uh, Dean, what are your thoughts about, uh, you know, Clinton has a 90% chance of, of winning right now, according to Lloyds of London and every uh, five, the 528 blog. And uh, so it's, it's more than likely, but anything could happen. There could be a new WikiLeaks bombshell. We don't know. But let's say uh, Clinton wins. Uh, there's a, a real strong base of supporters for Trump. What do you think they're going to do? I uh, came across a great article this week in the New Yorker magazine. Um, it was written by a Ryan Liza, L-I-Z-Z-A. It's, it was just a couple of days ago. I think it was October 16th. And the, the title of the article was Steve Bannon's Vision hmm. for the Trump Coalition after election day i don't know if you caught that scott no i know about steve bannon and the uh 
Breitbart News. So you know who he is. Oh, yeah, he he's is, running the campaign. He's, he's scorched earth. He's CEO of uh, of the, the Donald Trump uh, campaign. Oh, yeah. But, uh, you know, he's on leave this past summer from... Uh, uh, Breitbart? You know, Breitbart, you know, which is the right-wing news site where he served as executive chairman. And, uh, you know, he honed in on a view of uh, international politics. And, uh, you know, I, I also echo, I'm very concerned about what's going to happen after November 8th. I mean, just some quotes out of this article. If you, if, and if, I'd love the audience to go read it, Scott, Anthony, if you haven't seen it, Rhea, I mean, uh, you know, there's a tremendous response to these poll numbers the last, the last week and Trump's response to these numbers coming right out of this article is to tell his supporters repeatedly in recent days that the election is rigged, creating a sense of a grievance about the likely results that can be exploited after November 8th. Trump and Bannon had, have given up on trying to defeat Clinton. They seem more interested in creating a platform for a new ethno-nationalist politics that may bedevil the Republican Party and the country for a very long time to come. Trump has been a long conspiracy theorist. He gained a prominent role in American politics in 2011 by questioning Barack Obama's birthplace. In 2012, he claimed that the concept of global warming was created by and for the Chinese in order to make U.S. manufacturing non-competitive. During this election, he has alleged that Obama founded ISIS, that Ted Cruz's father, Rafael Cruz, was involved in John F. Kennedy's assassination, and that the Department of Labor fakes its unemployment numbers, and that the Justice Department colluded with Hillary Clinton to let her off the hook in its investigation of her use of private email server while she was the Secretary of State. It's no surprise then that Trump has been advised for decades by Roger Stone, a prominent political strategist and conspiracy theorist who believes that Lyndon B. Johnson had killed Kennedy and that George H. Bush may have tried to kill Ronald Reagan. It's also shocking that Trump has been a regular guest on the radio show of Alex Jones, who, among other interesting things, believes that our Americans are in danger of being controlled by clockwork elves. But it took someone a little smarter and a little bit more cynical than Trump, Stone, or Jones to distill Trump's platform. Incredible. What an article. Wow. You know, uh, I, I, I'm up to date with all of that. And I think what Trump is doing is exactly what you just said, Dean. He is, first, he doesn't like to be known as a loser. So he's, he's already looking past the election and want, he wants to have a soft landing, basically. So... Um, He's putting all these things in. It's the, the media is going after him, although he, no one exploits the media more than him. The hypocrisy is unbelievable. And um, this, this, the most disturbing thing that I find, and I, I think Anthony is really on target with this, um, and it's so dangerous, and it's, it's, you just don't play with fire. Um, when he says beforehand that the election is rigged, um, that's going to create a, a de it's going to delegitimize the election thereafter. I don't think he's going to have a concession speech, and that that is just that is like a banana republic. That's a really big problem, and um, I, I think that he's playing for another day. And uh, I agree with everything that you said, Dean. It's really disturbing but Scott, we know, I, we know everything ahead, right? in this country is rigged the stock market is rigged gold and silver prices are rigged <laughs> um, i mean there's so much stuff that's rigged. it's all really rigged when you think about it the powers that be are going to make the things that they want happen uh, just like 2008 the central bankers and they, they reflected it in that movie um that the one that came out uh, not the big short but the one that came out right. years ago with it with the uh the uh, bank that was representing bear stearns the guy was basically sitting there like really you're gonna let us take the fall for this you guys are rolling on 
on the, you know, the uh, mortgage backed securities. Sure. They're like, you know, we have to sacrifice you. Sorry. Like, bye bye. Right. And, you know, uh, they basically told them, listen, you're going to take the fall for this. We're going to get off scot free. And uh, that's, that's that. So it's not very far fetched to think that the, whether the markets are rigged or the political markets are rigged, it's really not that far out. But, I don't think. You know, I, I agree with you that a lot of the things are probably rigged as insiders' games. And, and let's not be naive. But there was. Um, a study done by Republicans um, during the Bush administration about voter fraud. And out of 1 billion votes that they've uh, tested, they came up with 38 voter fraud cases. That is like a rounding error. And that's a fact. So when right. people, when, when Donald Trump starts saying it's rigged, well, the facts are the facts. Um, yes, there's going to be some people uh, that that are dead, that, that voted. But it's a rounding error. It's 38 people out of 1 billion. And that's a fact. That's that's You could check that out online. Rhea, uh, what are your thoughts about this? And then uh, I'd like to hear more. You know, Dean said so much. I'd like to hear more about that also. Yeah, right. So firstly, all those things that Dean said, I think the world sees America like that. Um, sees it as kind of the position you're in at the moment with the Trump thing and the Hillary thing, wherever you fall, it's like if you take the blue pill, you'll stay in the world you're in and it goes the way it goes. But if you take the red pill, you take a chance on another world. It's like the Matrix kind of thing, stroke Orwell 1984, that thing going on. I've seen video footage, undercover video footage of one of the commissioners of New York coming out and saying uh, the voter fraud, uh, the voter rigging is real because of the ID. So that poll that you refer to as fact, Scott, I would highly question that after seeing the commissioner for New York saying it's rigged and got caught on camera with it, um, that they're driving them from one place to another to another because there's no voter ID. That's, what ID do you need to vote? That's Rudy Giuliani who has gone off the deep end, who's been pushing that or peddling that uh, myth. It's it's it's, it's really Listen, anecdotal and uh, cherry picking. I know we have more to speak about. All I know is from my perspective, uh, this uh, election year has been nothing short of being extremely painful. I think it hurts the country, hurts our democracy, and sends so many bad messages around the world. That's how I feel. So right. And Rhea, I wanted to ask you one other question on this subject. Uh, I mean, could you see a Brexit uh, happening here in, in America? God, no, you're nothing like unified enough. <laughs> <laughs> I had to ask you that question. But that's a, that's a really God. good question, Dean. I had to ask you but that the question. South, the South could succeed, I heard. Yeah. Right? Like you have Texas that wants to right. secede but they from, did want from to, the country. Yeah. You have even now. They, they, they're but talking you know, about but, it. But you know, it's not really South and North anymore. It's the people that are disenfranchised and the ones that are the elite. And that could be from the Rust Belt to the Southwest. Oh, yeah, yeah, so yeah. what you said is correct when you said there could be riots. It's not going to be geographic. It's going to be a classification yeah. of where or your socioeconomic yeah, yeah, condition. Yeah, class system. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Very good. So uh, it's interesting. I, th I think the world looks in and goes, what is it going to take for American people to wake up, see what's going on and see this gross misconduct of power? Um, that would be a common term of what the world world sees, Scott. You know, just to end this, um, I, I, you, you're, 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 you're really on target, uh, Ria, today. And uh, as always, I don't want to just say... Yeah, Scott, just, I, yeah. Scott I was, I, were you implying that Ria... No, I, I, The other I, days, Ria's not on target. It, 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 it definitely came out the wrong way. And that's why I corrected myself right away, because I'm, I'm, I'm on a recording right now. Uh, I feel sorry for you after we go off the air here. <laughs> you know, I forgot what I was going to say already. So now you're going to have to talk. I just lost my thought <laughs> Rio, what were you just saying just get, get my thought back again okay so now i'm going to take you off the thought now so oh. it's what i'm going to do <laughs> you're great okay okay so it's where we're going to go with this is amongst all the media hype um the one thing that can be seen i mean you've got this mad theater circus election thing going on in your country we have the world this militarizing at a million miles an hour which makes the formula more and more likely for a blunder, uh, if not something more concise. Nobody knows what's true. 
you know, I, I voice an opinion of this um, New York guy, commissioner guy, you say, no, it's rubbish, he's been peddling it. So it's immediately disarmed. And we end up in this world of untruths, outright lies, corruption, rigging. And you before you know it, you're teetering on the edge of a banana republic. And the problem is the people in your world and my world don't understand really what a banana pr- republic is. So the way I tend to cut through the misinformation that I see daily from various different parts of the globe is see it as a science test. So in a science test, there is no emotion evolved. Is what you do. Imagine laying out 14 petri dishes. There's about 14 main regions of the world that are warring. Imagine each one was a culture inside a petri dish. But that culture is dying. It's definitely not thriving and it's decaying very fast. You ask the scientists, would you please look down at those petri dishes to see why those cultures are dying? So the scientist looks at each one and goes, sure enough, they're dying. But we found a common link between all of them. There's a foreign culture that is common amongst all of them. So if you was doing a science test, you would have to say, right, remove the common link between all of them and see how the cultures thrive and have a guess who that common culture is. Wow. Wow. That is wow. that is great. And we yeah, are unbelievable. That was wow. That was that's a great way. And and it kind of goes into what I was gonna say, which I forgot before. I think there is a yearning. I think people do not like Hillary Clinton and they do not like Donald Trump. And that's 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 not hypotheses anymore. Um I think that the people that are disenfranchised in the United States want a blow up of Washington. I get it, but they have the wrong messenger. Okay. So um, it's unfortunate because this is the year that they could have had a, a real smart, independent billionaire that has good ethics and, and people respect. And that person is the person that could have really changed the the whole political system uh for instance um just you know a, a gates a warren buffett a, a bloomberg people that can't be influenced that are very smart and everyone could rally around so although donald trump um is is the manifestation of this uh, uh madness and this anger that's going on with politics he is the wrong person for it so it's just it, what the way i look at it is it's a the the worst missed opportunity we've ever had wow I appreciate that, Scott. But as I was giving the and, you know, everyone's entitled to their own view. There should be a free marketplace for people to be able to air their views and what they feel is right or wrong or indifferent rather than censored out. But in that example that I was giving you those Petri dishes, what was the common link? Well, American American culture. Exactly. Right. What is the American military and the cultures uh, of the different uh, the, around the world? Okay, the military uh, was the common link. Yes, yes, yes so yes. military uh, muddying around in everybody's business. Exactly. Yeah. So if you was going to do a scientific test to see why these cultures, because a culture in a petri dish can reflect a culture geopolitically, the Middle East, yes, Iran, Israel, wherever, and find while it's dying. And if there was a common link between all the areas that are going through an accelerated rate of destruction, and there was a common link in the uh, scientific experiment, the first thing the head guy would say was, right, remove the common link and see what the cultures do without a common link. Is it a causal link to the destruction? And you'll never know unless it's removed and there's zero chance of that happening. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, well, to close this this subject out, uh, all I know is I am extremely, extremely concerned that if Donald Trump does not win this election, I'm very concerned about a uh, violent rebe- rebellion, and uh, that's what I'm. Very, oh, he's coming, Dean. That's what I'm very. Yeah, that's I, what, I think that's I think, what I'm very concerned about. I think we're all agreeing, and that that's that's scary. Rhea, on that note, uh, are there other uh, subjects or topics that you'd like to uh, discuss on the show at this time? Yeah, I have two. I have a light one and a not so light one. As soon as I just did a sort of heavy example, let's just carry that on, then I'll do the light one. The one I wanted to bring up with you um, in the Globalist playbook is one of a digital currency, i.e. going cashless. So can any of you guys think of the obvious pitfalls of going into a cashless society wow you're dependent on electricity oh that would be one yeah absolutely that's entirely that's a good one entirely dependent on ele- if we have a solar flare that hits the earth forget it with we're, we're toast no it's electric with three um, yeah. 
I, I, I have one, Rhea, but it seems just too obvious. You're vulnerable to a major hack. Wow. That would be another one. That's what I was going to say, a major hack. I, I can't come up with another one. I was going to say what Scott just said, major hack. Okay, here's the problem. Within the global economic scene and the eco heads, whether you're Keynesian or Austrian, pro, post-Keynesian, new Austria, whatever, wherever you lie, the governing aspect within any forming um, society is the zero level interest rates because of the way fractional banking works. So the one thing that that is a, a solid bottom for all cultures that use a fiat currency, which is currently a global affair because nothing is gold backed, is zero percent interest rates. There is a solid floor for all these corrupt banksters. They can't go below a zero percent interest rates because if they do, there'll be a run on the banks. As soon as they know, as soon as people know that they're being charged to keep money in the bank, they're going to want to take it out and there'll be a run on the banks and it will collapse it. But within a digital society, they can run zero. They can run negative interest rates because what are you going to how are you going to stop them using negative interest rates in a digital society? You can't. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Well, well, there's negative, negative rates negative in Japan. Problem. Anthony, oh, yeah, do, you, do you have any? Do you have anything else about this subject you wanted to mention? No, no, I think, you know, she makes a very valid point. I, and I didn't think about that uh, um, idea. But yeah, when there is no cash, there can be no run on the banks to pull that cash out. That's crazy. That's uh, absolutely crazy. That's that's really scary again. Rhea, what's the next thing that you had before we close out the show? Okay, so here's a quick one is, what advice would you give to your 16-year-old self? <laughs> Man, uh, wow. I would have said, make sure you listen to your grandfather, uh, you know, my grandfather who raised me. And any time I didn't listen to him, this oh. things went terribly wrong for me. Uh, or I should say I'd be in a much, much better place in my life if, if I if I listened to, you know, everything he told me to do. Wow. My, That's not open and honest. My answer is uh, not my uh, grandmother or grandfather, but uh, you guys have gotten to know my mother, Jean Blackman, that uh, listen to your mother. Uh, still to this day, my mother says she's, uh, not a hundred percent right, but she's 99% pretty damn right. Close, right. She's pretty close. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, for everyone out there, listen to your mother. Um, you took the words right out of my mouth. Um, um, my mother and father who have since passed away, uh, was such a great influence in my life. And, uh, you know, uh, at the time, I would question a lot of their wisdom, but as we look now, it, it was so correct, and it, it really has to do with um, older world values that I think we've lost in today's age, um, so I like to see that coming back. What about you, Rhea? Do you know what? I, I've asked you, and I didn't think of one for myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> mine would be, um, mine would be a, a, a phrase from Gandhi. And that would be act local, think global. Mm. Hmm. Wow. So on that note, uh, I just want to thank all of you once again, like I always do. Thanks for being here on the show. And uh, Anytime, just, a, just a great show we had. And uh, as I say all the, the time, I can't wait to do the next one because I don't think I know of another show that's like this and has the chemistry of the personalities like we have on the show. And I also want to send out to uh, our lovely friend and colleague there all the way across the Atlantic in the UK, Rhea. I can't thank you enough for just a great informative uh, show and perspective, how you're able to, with this uh, new show that's only three months old, how, uh, how you're able to give a global world perspective and, and bring that over to, uh, to the show for us to discuss all of us. So thank Can you. Can I just say something, Dean? Yes. Um, regardless of all this dark talk and everything, and when you get lost in the brain fog and the mudded waters, the clear way forward is, is it's always got to be sort of love and peace to your neighbours. That's the way forward, regardless of what you hear in the news. As my mom said on that uh, very first show that we did to launch uh, the show back in late July, and if anyone hasn't listened to it, it's show number one on YouTube and on iTunes, uh, Gene Blackman, 
Uh, what did she say to, to all of us? She said she'd like to see uh, more love and more love and family focused on, which which she doesn't see today. And that should be the takeaway of our show, right? Um, and I'm afraid uh, that our society right now is going the opposite direction. So hopefully, we could add a little bit of light and bring that love and and peace and friendliness uh, to our listeners. Well, listen. Thanks again to all of you, and uh, this show has been very informative inspiring, educational, and uh, I want to I wanna hear from all our listeners. Listeners can reach out uh, to us with the free text number. For U.S. residents, it's 631-372-8849. That's 631-372-8849. We'd love to hear from all of you. Include your name and location, and we will mention you on the show. Please don't forget to like us on Facebook and to hit the subscribe button on the show's YouTube channel. If you would like to leave a comment, use the box below. If you'd like to share your story, ideas, and be a guest on the show, go to deanbleckman.com and email me. I would like to thank all my listeners for being with us today. From all of us at the Dean Blackman Show, have a great day. You've been listening to The Dean Blackman Show, live from Long Island, New York. From all of us here, we'd like to thank you for tuning in. We look forward to hearing your comments via Facebook, Twitter, Skype, and email. And don't forget, you can visit the webpage anytime for the up-and-coming guest list. From all of us here, have a good evening.